Guten Morgen, liebe Zuhörer und Zuschauer, meine Damen und Herren, mein Good Name ist... Good morning, uh, dear guests uh, and participants. My name is Christiane Grefe. I'm a journalist with a focus on uh, ecology and climate change and uh, agriculture. And I'm honored to be able to warmly welcome you here, here to this webinar of the Heinrich Böll Foundation and its partners, uh, Bread for the World, Save Our Seeds, and uh, FDCL, the Research and Documentation Center, Chile and Latin America. In order for you to understand, uh, this uh, webinar will be translated into English and German, so please choose your language, uh, clicking on the little globe button down below. You've already seen that what our topic is, nature-based solutions uh, in uh, climate protection. That sounds really green, but uh, it's a bit ambivalent and therefore quite controversial. So uh, where are the pathways and where are ways out of it? All the numbers are favoring that uh, the Paris Climate Agreement numbers will not be reached. And uh, we are lacking time in order to reach the two degree threshold or 1.5 degree threshold and negative emissions are coming closer to our intention and the nature is supposed to help us out uh, to reduce those emissions and to store them. The um, compensation mechanisms are part of it, the storage of carbon in forests and in the agriculture in soils are discussed. Uh, then uh, BEX is discussed uh, where we try to sequestrate biogas and store it in the soil. And we have other technological approaches. According to estimates, uh, those nature-based solutions are supposed to reduce our emissions uh, up to 37%, uh, which are important in order to reach our two degree goal. Those ambitions are not new, but uh, they are reviving right now. Uh, since uh, climate neutrality has become the buzzword for the fight against climate change, uh, different countries and, uh, and um, companies try to emit only as much uh, CO2 as uh, in some place else on the globe can be retrieved from the atmosphere. It sounds quite good, but uh, it has a downside because natural based solutions. Uh, it does not, uh, do not only help to renaturize uh, our landscapes, but uh, it threatens to overburden our natural environment uh, by um, tackling topics like land use and land grabbing. Therefore, uh, what contribution can natural climate things and storage possibilities really do? How can we conserve our biologic diversity, watch out for food sovereignty and the rights of the local communities? How do we bring all this together with climate protections? And uh, what um, uh, pathways uh, are we going down during the different climate summits. It is a very complex issue, of course, and uh, in order to shed some light into it, uh, we have invited uh, very interesting experts here to our panel that I would just like to briefly introduce. One of them is Kate Dooley, um, who is an environment research, the uh, activist Corina de la Plaza from the uh, Global Forest Coalition, and Judah Kill, who is a biologist and works uh, for an NGO um, focusing on uh, forest conservation. And last but not least, Norbert Gorison from the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, and Nuclear Safety. So, welcome to you all. And we would like to start off with a few housekeeping remarks for all those who are logging in here for the first time in a Zoom webinar from our. Series. It is a series with four parts uh, called Contested Nature, and all of the different webinars are covering different uh, issues uh, related to biodiversity that are not as well known to the public and to the wider public. In the first edition in September, we were talking about uh, the UN Biodiversity Convention, what we can expect from it. A lot has been um, delayed to next year because of Corona, but uh, many issues are t dealt with that are important for biodiversity conservation, new gene drives uh, were one of those issues uh, that uh, 
called uh, the magic uh, solution for some of them, for others, uh, very mere evil. And uh, then uh, in the third edition, we looked at what it means uh, to not only use uh, the DNA uh, of our biological resources uh, used in the medicine and in agriculture, but uh, isn't it possible to make use of uh, the digital information and of the information that with digital sequencing and uh, then the uh, um, um, benefit sharing and profit shifting. So this is a bit uh, what we've done on Hinside. If you're interested in following our editions, uh, you'll find the link on our website uh, of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Biodiversity is the main issue, therefore. Now, the fourth edition, Nature-Based Solutions or Natural Climate Solutions, is our issue for today. And this is what we talk about here on the panel. And then later on in the last half hour or so you will be able to raise your questions and uh, those of you who are interested in raise your questions please click on the q and a button and down below you can write down your questions and my colleagues in the background will collect the questions and uh, it is really nice to see that we have many many people listening today 333 in total then uh, we have the chat um, function, not for questions, but for you to interact. Um, this is also the place where we will publish information, like links to publications and so on. Now, we have prepared a short survey because for you and us, it is, of course, interesting to know who we have gathered. And this survey will now be shown and we would really like to see you participate. So please tell us who you are. Now, without further ado, I would like to start off directly with Kate Julie. She's a research fellow at the Climate Energy College of the University of Melbourne. Uh, we're really thankful to her because in Australia it's already uh, late afternoon and evening so she really made up some time for us. Uh, she is um, tackling with uh, forest policy in Europe and Africa and uh, is a, an active researcher for many years to look at uh, the uncertainties and uh, the irregularities uh, when it comes to carbon accounting. Kate Dooley, once again, thank you so much for joining us and we're looking forward to your introduction to this very important and complex issue. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for that. I will just um, share my screen here. Okay, so I think you should all be able to see my presentation now. Um, yes, yeah, so I am going to try and introduce you to this um, complex topic, as Christiane said, and hopefully um, you will be able to get the information you need from this presentation to at least have lots of questions to ask. So I want to start with talking about the multiple and overlapping crises that we are now facing in terms of climate change, biodiversity loss and land degradation. I've got here up on the screen three key global assessments that have been released in the last few years from the um, IPCC on climate change and also from the IPCC on climate change and land degradation and from the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services on um, a global assessment on biodiversity loss. So these reports show that land and land use change is intimately linked to the climate. Changes in land use result in changes to the climate and vice versa and changes in land use and the climate also impact biodiversity. So all of these issues are very interlinked. Um, by biodiversity, I'm referring to the diversity within species, between species and of ecosystems, which is declining faster than at any time in human history with um, a million species at risk of extinction was the um, headline finding from that best report. So we really, we have all the science we need to fully understand and tackle these crises. What, most of what I present for the rest of this presentation comes from um, these three reports. So focusing first on the climate crisis and as um, Christiana's introduction um, 
talked about, there's a lot of talk now about net zero and uh, climate neutrality. So I talk in this presentation about net zero. I think you can think of those terms as, as pretty much the same um, thing. So net zero, we, this has come along from the Paris Agreement where the long-term objective is to balance emissions from sources and sinks. You can see on the screen there, um, oops, sorry, just go back one. Sorry, so um, balance emissions from sources and sinks. So there's actually a graph here that you can't see because the box is over it, but never mind, we've got similar graphs later on. So you get to um, have to look at less graphs, that's always a good thing. So um, what net zero means is um, carbon emissions decline down to zero and then they go negative, so they go below zero. And I'll show you that in a graph later. Most net zero targets are, are at around um, but for 2050, so we're seeing a proliferation in net zero or climate neutrality targets from governments and from businesses, um, corporations. Uh, but the question is, is this actually going to drive emissions down enough for the 1.5 degree and 2 degree goals that we need to meet in the Paris Agreement? Um, well, and it's not all bad news. The shift, like the, the idea of net zero gives a real shift from the from incremental targets that we had under previous agreements to driving emissions down to zero. It, it really communicates now to the whole world that emissions are going to zero. But the devil is in the detail in terms of what does the met, net mean. So here I'm going to talk about three problems with the net zero targets. Um, compensating ongoing fossil fuel emissions by um, sequestering carbon into forests is a, a problem. Um, the potential for mitigation delay that net zero brings and an over-reliance on land-based carbon dioxide removal, which can threaten biodiversity and food security. So I'll just go briefly through each of these issues. So first, there's a common misunderstanding that sequestering carbon from the air into terrestrial sinks. So terrestrial sinks means forests or soils, as was mentioned, um, other agricultural crops or um, regeneration with bushes. There's a common misunderstanding that this can compensate for burning fossil fuels. As it says on the slide here, one tonne of fossil fuel emissions minus one tonne of forest sequestration equals net zero. This is the misunderstanding. Um, what this does is it doesn't properly understand the carbon cycle. So by burning fossil fuels, people are changing the carbon cycle. We're adding carbon to the three active carbon pools that are depicted on that slide there and increasing the carbon in that active carbon cycle. Now that carbon doesn't come back out of the carbon cycle on any relevant time frame. So all we've all we have is a one-way channel from fossil fuels to the active carbon cycle. And we can move it from the atmosphere to the land to the ocean, but that doesn't take it out of the carbon cycle. So overall we have more emissions um, and that offsetting doesn't doesn't lower emissions. Kate, uh, Kate. Uh, yes. Entschuldigung, eine kurze Bitte, die übersetzt. Okay, just briefly, um, the interpreters are asking you to speak a little bit slower because it's very complex what you're talking about here. Thank you. Thank you so yes. much. Yes, sorry, I will do that. Okay, no problem. Um, I have an issue in that. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay, so we need to remember, um, as I've mentioned in the previous slide, that warming is caused by cumulative emissions. So CO2 stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years, and that's what causes the warming. Now, mitigation delay, if we delay the reduction in emissions, um, increases cumulative emissions. You can see that on this slide, the first um, graph on the left shows a net zero target being moved from 2055 to 2040. And then the graph on the right shows the, the blue in the blue line that there's reduced emissions because that target was achieved earlier. So the, the more quickly we reduce emissions the, and, and get to net zero, the less carbon dioxide we've put into the atmosphere and the less long-term warming we have and, and later problems we have with needing to remove it. There's several recent papers that have looked at net zero targets uh, for European countries, Ireland, Sweden, and the UK, and they've concluded that the date for reaching net zero should be achieved in, not in 2050, but 2035 or 2040. Okay, so linked to that, offsetting the first slide and then delay the second issue I showed means more emissions in the atmosphere. 
So more emissions in the atmosphere means we're committed to removing more emissions. This graph shows four illustrative pathways for 1.5 degrees from the IPCC. Now, all of these pathways have net zero at 2055. That's when the solid line crosses the horizontal zero bar. But they all have very different amounts of emissions. So on the um, left, the first graph, emissions go down very quickly and there's very little removals. On the right, so the gray shaded area is total emissions. The line crossing zero is just the net emissions. So on the right, you can see a huge amount of total emissions in the gray shaded. And then that requires a huge amount of removals to compensate and bring those emissions back out of the atmosphere. Now, the problem with this is most options for removing carbon from the atmosphere rely on land. And most of the planet's land is already used by humans. We already directly affect more than 70% of the global ice-free land surface. This is across all biomes. And huge expanses in grazing lands and permanent crop lands since the 1960s uh, a part of this um, big expansion in land use, which are also the leading causes of forest loss. Increasing pressure on land is also a leading driver of biodiversity loss. So the report I mentioned at the start from the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services modeled the potential impacts of mitigation scenarios for 1.5 degrees they found that all scenarios in the IPCC reports had negative impacts on biodiversity. So they modeled the scenarios with very early emission reductions and very little removals, and the scenarios with all the extra bray emissions and large removals. Of course, there was a difference. There was less impact on biodiversity in the um, what's known as SSP1 in the uh, scenarios with earlier emission reductions but all scenarios had negative impacts on biodiversity. This is from both climate change, but also from land use change. So this is because the mitigation scenarios currently assume we will need land use change um, as part of our mitigation effort. And um, the graph here shows um, the decline in species rich richness, as well as an increase in what it says here, regulating NCP. Um, it just means resource extraction. I'm sorry, there's some issue with going forward. Ah, that button works better. So just showing here the, the um, scenario with the steepest emission reductions, still negative biodiversity impacts. So where do nature-based solutions fit into all of this? And how do we define nature-based solutions? They are being defined very broadly, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more in the panel. But to further explore how carbon dioxide removal might impact biodiversity, in a recent paper I did, I categorized these CDR, CDR options, that's carbon dioxide removal options, uh, by process. So these are the four processes here. Land use, regenerative, marine, and chemical. Now, while many people interpret nature-based solutions, they, they think that that includes things like afforestation, reforestation, BEX, which is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, and biochar, all of these activities, which are in the first box here, rely on land use change. So as we just talked about, land use change is the leading driver of biodiversity loss and increasing land use change as part of a climate mitigation strategy is only going to result in more species extinction, decreased food security and threats of land grabs. Uh, marine and chemical CDR options, the boxes down the bottom, also contribute to biodiversity loss through drivers such as resource extraction, pollution and invasive species. So the only um, CDR options that we found would not in, um, impact on the direct drivers to biodiversity loss are those that protect and restore nature. We labelled these regenerative options, which can include restoration of wetlands and coastal ecosystems, so they're not just land-based, but they don't include um, the land use change activities that, that require land use change on a big scale, afforesting or reforesting large areas of land, 
that aren't, weren't, aren't currently forested has negative impacts um, on biodiversity. So in summary, in conclusion, um, what are the real solutions if nature-based solutions, um, some of them uh, can be good and some of them can be very risky. Relying on net zero targets can actually see emissions increase. So we need, um, what we need to do in terms of that is have separate targets for emissions and removals. That is the simplest and most immediate solution that governments could be taking rather than announcing 2050 net zero targets that really we don't know how many emissions is that actually going to mean. We need separate targets for how emissions are reduced and how, um, how and the degree to which any carbon dioxide will be removed from the atmosphere, not, not fudged together. Um, related to that is the idea of a firewall, no fungibility between fossil and biotic carbon. So that means that we can't add more carbon to the atmosphere because we removed some via trees or land or other ecosystems. We, we can remove it by trees and lands and other ecosystems, but that doesn't justify adding carbon to the atmosphere. And then um, in terms of what we can actually do to remove that carbon, regeneration and restoration of natural ecosystems to meet climate, biodiversity and sustainable development objectives. So we need to be very careful about what kind of activities are taking place on the ground and, and who they impact. And I think the, the next panelists will talk about that. And finally, it's really essential that we're respecting rights. Um, there's a wealth of research that shows that collectively managed areas overlap with intact natural landscapes. Indigenous people's areas are, are the areas that are currently intact and are rich sources of carbon and biodiversity and they need to be kept that way. Thank you very much for listening. Ja, vielen Dank, Kate Dooley, für diese Einführung. Thank you very much, Kate Dooley, for this introduction. I've got one follow-up question. If this is so that the regenerative approaches or restoration of ecosystems is the best, uh, or from your point of view, the only solution that makes sense, so what is your assessment in terms of the international policy in this regard? under consideration of the European Green Deal, which is uh, negotiated right now. So do you think that in Europe we see a sufficient um, initiative uh, and what's the, the, uh, what's the situation in Europe or what's the share of Europe? What should Europe actually do? Um, yeah, so the European Green Deal has a lot of really good elements and um, it was certainly when it was announced last year, it was very bold, um, forward looking, progressive announcement. It was welcomed broadly by NGOs, um, NGOs on the panel can correct me later. Um, but of course, the devil's always in the detail. And of course, the European Union could always do more. And there's definitely drawbacks. So at the moment, the, um, the draft climate law is being is making its way through um, various processes and the increase of the target reduction target to 55% is very welcome. But the missing still from that draft climate law to ensure that it's actually a robust contribution to um, the Paris Agreement would be the separate emissions and removals, as I said at the end, and I think the European Parliament has actually called for that now, as well as bringing forward the net zero date to somewhere around 2040. I'm not sure, there's probably different positions on that. Um, but more broadly, and in relation to the, the um, natural climate options, the there's a few other um, um, strategies as part of the European Green Deal, such as the biodiversity strategy, and the um, forest strategy, or more specifically, the, um, there's a, been a communication on forest restoration. So these are um, really initiatives from the European Union that have a lot of promise and potential, but require now some more um, binding targets, committed funding, and mainstreaming them also into the draft climate law. Ja, vielen Dank. Um, ich muss mich ja kurz entschuldigen dafür, Thank dass ich... Much. I have to apologize. Um, I have to look down from time to time because I have different channels of information. So I get information from the chat as well. And it looks a bit, uh, might look a bit strange uh, from time to time. But thank you very much for your assessment so far. Um, as far as I understood, uh, one of the main risks 
is that um, the nature-based solutions can be used as a pretext um, to be less committed in the uh, prevention of uh, to the prevention of emissions, but that there are also opportunities. And uh, now I would like to touch upon the um, indigenous people. I would like to ask Corina de la Plaza to explain from her perspective the nature-based solutions. Corina works for the Global Forest Coalition, which is a global association of non-governmental organizations that are fighting for the rights of indigenous people, so of groups of people who live within the forest, from the forest, and um, many studies show that uh, they are very important for the eco-function of the um, forest, so are quite responsible in, uh, in this regard. Uh, Corina de la Plaza has launched a campaign with the impressive title, Our Nature is Not Your Solution. So what is behind it? Who is in charge of this campaign and why this rejection? Yeah, um, hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Um, I'm very excited to be part of the panel, so thanks uh, for inviting me. And it's, I think it's very important that we are having uh, this uh, conversation around what uh, we understand by nature-based solutions, but also nature climate solutions. So I think that before I get into, you know, why the, our nature is not your solution campaign, um, why we launched that campaign, I think it's important that I first explain our concerns around the term uh, nature-based solutions and nature uh, climate solutions, because in our concerns is the, the, the rationale of uh, this um, campaign. So just uh, very quickly, because Kate also touched upon this, so the term nature-based solutions uh, really start appearing in the scientific literature by the early 2000s, but we have seen how during the last few years, mainly since 2016, it has really gained a lot of momentum. And there was a key moment also last year in the September with the Climate Action Summit, where we saw for the first time a high level event on nature-based solutions. And that you know, gave us the signal that of course, this is only going to get more and more uh, relevant. And we think as Global Force Coalition that one of the main problems or one of our main concerns is the ambiguity. Right, that surrounds the term nature-based solutions at the moment. I mean, there is not an adopted uh, formal definition of the term. There has been attempts by uh, groups like IUCN and others to you know, define and have a more uh, comprehensive view of what nature-based solutions could look like, but there is not a definition adopted by international official policymaking bodies like the CBD or the UNFCCC. And so um, this means that at the moment, MBS is this big umbrella that means many things uh, to different people and that encompasses the good, the bad, and, and the evil. That's the, the way we kind of uh, look at this. So, um, because it's such a broad and, and term and there's so much ambiguity around it, this uh, leaves the window open for some actors to use it on their, to their advantage and you know, to continue uh, pushing for carbon markets, for offsets uh, based on forest and land carbon credits, for afforestation and reforestation. Uh, Kate also mentioned these initiatives that are many times based actually on the monoculture tree plantations, which I'll get into that in a couple of minutes. And of course, these are all what we call false solutions because they don't address the roots of, of climate change. They don't uh, mitigate climate change and they are not useful for climate change adaptation either. And this is also where the term nature climate solutions comes in. So as I said, nature-based solutions is the umbrella and it has adaptation, it has um, disaster risk reduction, it has human health and it has climate uh, change mitigation. So those are the natural climate solutions. And at the, mo at the moment, the problem is that these two are being put at the same level. So, and I think part of this is because of this lack of understanding or definition of, uh, you know, what MBS are, but also I say because it's very convenient for some actors to continue with some of the forest and land 
uh, mitigation approaches that, as I said, many of them are actually false solutions to the problem that we have um, at stake. And so just to give you an example, I'm sure that uh, most of you have heard by now about the tree planting fever, that's how I call it, that have uh, you know, taken hold of uh, both governments, but also private actors. So there's been lots of uh, tree planting initiatives, probably the newest and largest one was uh, this tree, one tree trillion initiative launched last year in the World Economic Forum. But it's not the only one. So there is the, also the bond talents and there is lots of commitments made by um, industries, including gas and oil, uh, fossil fuel uh, industry companies to uh, plant trees and uh, you know, to brand this as nature-based solutions or nature climate solutions and include it as one of the strategies or activities under their uh, net zero commitments. And so, um, the problem is when we see these uh, tree planting initiatives, I think that uh, one of the, we have to ask ourselves a few questions, not only one. One of them, also Kate touched upon that, is uh, where these massive large scale uh, tree planting initiatives, where are they going to take place? Because you need also a massive amount of land to plant, in this case, let's say a trillion trees, right? So to whom belongs uh, that land? and who is already making use of that land. And also another key question that I think that we have to ask ourselves when we see these initiatives and all of this afforestation and reforestation as part of MBS is um, uh, what are we planting here? Right, so is it native species that are going to contribute to, contribute to ecosystem regeneration or is it other thing? Is it something different? And sadly, uh, in so many occasions, the, the answer to these questions are that the land that, uh, you know, where these activities uh, are implemented are actually used already by our communities. So we have land grabbing, we have displacement, and we have overall conflicts with uh, indigenous peoples and local communities that are, um, as I said, living or using that land. And to the second question, the answer, again, in so many occasions or very often is that what we are actually planting are monoculture and commercial tree plantations, which of course, are plantations are not forests. So they don't bring any of the climate mitigation benefits that uh, forests can bring. Not only that, but uh, in fact, they, are, they actually have lots of negative impacts like uh, fresh water depletion, they are totally devoid of biodiversity, that's why they are, they are also called uh, green deserts. They, um, uh, they have, um, they spoil the soil, so they reduce the fertility and, you know, they use a lot of agrochemicals to, to increase the productivity and um, the growth of, of these plantations, which of course pollutes the water and soil. So again, this is what uh, we are saying along with um, other issues like BEGS, uh, Kate already explained that. That's what we are seeing as being framed under MBS and as uh, being used for many um, actors to continue their, their business as usual. Um, I can give you an example, or maybe later if there is more time, but just, just very quickly, Shell, for instance, is one of, of these, I mean, this is the seventh most polluting uh, company in the world. And uh, Shell committed to get net zero by um, 2050. And as part of uh, that commitment, they, of course, they include what they actually call nature-based credits. Uh, so that's uh, a way through which they will get a net zero, but also uh, techno fixes or geoengineering like BEX. And they also want to invest 300 million uh, for tree planting initiatives. Uh, some of them actually happening or also taking place in Europe, like in Scotland, the Netherlands, and here in Spain, they already started with one of uh, these initiatives. So in all of this, in uh, this big, um, hot pot, so to speak, is where our campaign, uh, Our Nature is Not uh, Your Solution, uh, was born. So it was launched on the 22 of May, which is International Day of uh, Biodiversity. And the theme that the CBD, so the Convention for Bi Biological Diversity, uh, the theme that they choose for this year is our solution is in nature. So, you know, it's a very clear reference to nature-based solutions. And we just kind of rephrase a little bit that to say, you know, our nature is not your solution, to point out and to highlight 
all of these uh, false solutions and all of these uh, business as usual that many act actors are putting forward and they are you know, naming as nature-based solutions or, or they are taking advantage of, of the ambiguity of the term to put forward um, all of this. I can hear you. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Vielen Dank für, für, uh, für Ihre Perspektive. Many thanks for uh, your perspective. Uh, you say it may not happen that uh, people are displaced from uh, the countries that uh, we are calling reforestation, what are actually our monocultures, that uh, our emissions are burdened on other people. But we do have a positive backside because we need trees for our climate conservation and uh, we need to regenerate uh, uh, the uh, environment and this has to be financed and of course the government say they're not able to take up the financial burden so it would be good to um, give a share and to have the industry contribute uh, to that so what would be your proposal in order to have a constructive approach to that so I do think that uh, it's important to uh, protect what's you know already there and also to of course, fund um, ecosystem-based approaches, which by the way, it is a term that it's defined by the CBD and has this, let's say the good part of uh, MBS. As I said before, we see it now as it has the good, the bad and the evil. So ecosystem-based approaches is one of these uh, good things. And I say it's a well-defined term that it can benefit for, you know, for, for funding. But I think it's also key that uh, not only industries, but also, of course, government um, support and, of course, promote rights and community based approaches that are gender responsive. This is very important and that are truly uh, led and governed by communities. It is also important that they um, stop giving subsidies to the, you know, the industries or the or polluting sectors like fossil fuel industries, but also agribusiness and bioenergy. And, uh, well, we also have to support uh, to enable natural regeneration, but um, when it comes to private funding or, well, to the role that industries uh, could play in all of this, uh, first of all, I think that they need to make real district cuts in their emissions and they need to make real pledges, right? So, and this relates to the problematic that Kate mentioned around net zero and how that's uh, you know, it has a lot of uh, loopholes and allows them to go on with uh, their business as usual. But I'm also, you know, it's, it's quite common to hear a lot about leveraging um, finance from the private sector, from the industry to contribute to all of this. But once again, uh, with this, I think we have to be um, very cautious because we see how we've seen already, and this is the case, for instance, with monoculture tree plantations, how, part of this finance or all of it many times goes to the wrong kind of solutions, right? And I mean, we have to also ask ourselves what's the, the, the return that the private sector is looking for when they invest, for instance, as I said before, 300 millions in, in planting trees. I mean, my guess or my first guess would be that they um, expect something in, in return, right? Whether in the shape of economic profits or something, but that's a very big investment that hasn't happened before. So um, yeah, why is it happening now? What is that they see there? But again, I, I said, I think that um, from uh, both sectors, I'll say, um, okay. like I said, like this, it has to really support that these funds had to go to ecosystem-based approaches, but mainly to rights and community-based approaches. Ja, vielen Dank. Das klingt so, als ob man zumindest politische Ratsch. It sounds as if we needed political framework conditions that uh, make sure all of what uh, Corina de la Plaza has just uh, mentioned. And this brings us directly to the international negotiations on this topic. <coughs> and for quite some time, Jutta Kill has dealt with it. Jutta Kill is a biologist. She is 
a forest expert. She publishes uh, on this topic and is also committed in the global rainforest movement. Um, this is an organization. And for several years, she's been monitoring the so-called Red Agreement, R-E-D-D. -D. It's um, reduction emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, so red. It's been around for several years, but we are not making really headway in the framework of the climate um, agreement. Uh, so how should we assess the this agreement? Um, and so what are the opportunities or the chances that the demands that are just being mentioned, so participation, ecological, um, approach in terms of the reforestation programs etc that it is made sure um, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, so why does red not make any progress i would rather say well luckily red doesn't make much progress in the international climate debates and what we discuss about red today or what is one um, consequence from my past experience with RED um, for 15 years, I think this is something that we will also be able to see in 15 years from now from the nature-based uh, solutions. So RED actually makes the deviation by a carbon taxation of funding um, towards a phenomenon that goes way beyond carbon um, accounting. Uh, so red is basically dominating the international forest and more and more the international climate discussion or debate. It is based on an insufficient and thus also wrong view that deforestation would be the main problem. Of course, funding also plays its role, but to reduce everything to deforestation is actually neglecting the main drivers of, um, of the current situation. And if the problem analysis is wrong, then it's not really surprising that the instrument is also wrong, designed in the wrong way. and. Um, I would like to share my screen. Um, so it's not really surprising that the assumptions as such go into the wrong direction. So after 15 years, this instrument has had no effect. And this made quite clear that an assessment of the German participation or the German funding in particular for the Red Initiative And we have DEVAL, it's uh, an institute for evaluation. So even though the summary seems to be quite positive, however, the content of the actual text is actually uh, a bit different. So there they strike a balance um, on red and say, well, the actual uh, objective of RED has not been achieved and it might never be achieved, which is to make a contribution to a reduction of emissions um, due to deforestation. Instead, what we've seen is an adaptation of the targets, but still a positive assessment on the effectiveness of RED uh, is being made. So the evaluation was Similar evaluations could be made based on the funding from Norway. Norway is the second big donor of, for these red initiatives that they have also made several assessments and have come to similar conclusions. And Deva says that um, red has or is characterized um, by having only a limited effect on effectively reducing the main drivers of deforestation. And RED does not fulfill the initial expectations. And instead of dealing with this and saying that RED has not met the expectations, um, shouldn't we change the instrument, the tool, and uh, come back to 
what is actually the main driver of deforestation. Um, this was not be, this was not done. Instead, um, the targets were simply adjusted. And all this is an international policy. So other policy instruments have not been effective either. Otherwise, we would have not seen this large degree of deforestation. But red has caused a lot of damage and continues to do so. I think it would be very important to ask what has not happened. So what has not been done because this new dominant policy instrument red has been around and has been introduced in almost all the donor countries or industrialized countries we can see that their funding their support for the marking of indigenous territories have been reduced at the same time this means reducing instruments that have shown in the past of being very effective. For example, there were some questions in the Q&A box uh, and one referred to the uh, Amazon region and um, Amazon forest. Uh, and um, we, we saw that this, the recognition of indigenous rights is a very important a tool to protect forests. And when RED was started, these kind of initiatives were used less and less or applied less and less. So there was less funding and less attention. Uh, and we um, more and more frequently see this deviation via a taxation of carbon. So I can hear you because the mic is off. Well, if I might ask a follow-up question, is this due to RED or aren't these independent parallel processes? So how can you prove that RED is the cause for it? Well, I mean, I can't prove that it's the cause, but if RED wasn't there, then of course we would have a different focus. The debate would be different. I mean, if you take a look at the past 15 years of international forest debates or international debates on deforestation since RED, then it is more and more focused on technical issues of carbon sequestration. And it's less and less about the political causes of deforestation. So the focus has shifted to a completely different side. It's about improving carbon taxation, To de it's about development of technical instruments to um, measure or um, the carbon um, binding of uh, forests, etc. So the debate is actually shifting from the economy of deforestation, uh, it's shifting away. Uh, so it needs, we need to have a political debate where or who is interested in what and why is the deforestation uh, driven further. So this is something that we no longer discuss. So with RET, we only discuss the technical issue of how can we improve the carbon binding of the forest. Uh, um, the uh, carbon um, balance is actually quite uh, difficult uh, or carbon accounting rather is quite difficult. So how can we uh, assess this? Of course, the results need to be uh, calculable. So is this possible at all? Well, this is actually another question, which is um, linked to the red debate. Of course, the results, the successes need to be measured in tons carbon dioxide. How do you want to assess the many political and other advantages. How do you want to measure a campaign for the marking of indigenous territory in tons of carbon? So, I mean, you might be able to do it, but it shifts away the focus from the actual debate and uh, it binds a lot of funding and, um, and uh, time is wasted, actually. Um, 
time is wasted on carbon taxation instead of discussing real solutions. We have to discuss who's benefiting from deforestation. Oh, and maybe one thing that I would like to add, um, over the past 15 years, I have looked at different red initiatives and projects, but there was not a single one that managed to address the main drivers of deforestation. It was always about small scale farmers, small scale land use and demonizing it uh, and make it less detrimental. But this also means that the focus of the debate is being shifted. May I, may I say something? Uh, I uh, looked at a, a red project in Tanzania where the opposite actually happened. So where small scale farmers were actually motivated to maintain forest and um, they were provided with coal ovens that no longer needed to be fired with uh, wood. So can you give us a brief answer, please? So what do you think uh, it should make sure so that you can reach uh, your priorities? Well, of course, it's nice if you can provide uh, people with an energy efficient uh, cooking facility, but companies like Unilever or other big companies and big corporations, uh, what do they do? I mean, a cooking facility is not sufficient to, to offset this. I mean, nothing against this cooking facility, but why do we demand uh, from uh, people who have contributed nothing to climate change that they make the major effort and also be grateful for being given a new cooking facility? Um, and at the same time, we no longer debate this massive deforestation we simply let it continue so but what should happen so that it does not continue so maybe just two brief sentences well the climate debate needs to focus on natural carbon storages so we have to protect uh, coal gas and uh, lignite so we should protect these fossil um, carbon um, storage, so to speak. They need to stay underground. They need to stay where they are. Thank you very much for your perspective. We have now reached the political debate and I would call you like to welcome someone who is actually uh, doing politics, uh, Norbert Gorissen from the German um, Environmental Ministry the German Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Science, uh, Safety to be exact. He is the head of the International Cooperation Sub-Department. So he has to do with biodiversity protection and climate protection at the same time. And he deals with questions of funding first and foremost. So welcome Dr. Uh, Mr. Gorsen. So just a general question at the beginning. I mean, we have heard several critical voices that said, well, we have a wrong prioritization. What is the assessment of the federal government in terms of these nature-based solutions? So what kind of contribution can they make from your point of view? And could you also say something about uh, the possible risks and opportunities? Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kreef, and also to the Heinrich Böll Foundation for the invitation. I'm glad to uh, participate um, and to answer your question. Before I talk about nature-based solutions, I would like to say a few words uh, in order to correct an impression that has been made through the previous contributions. I mean, we have no interest whatsoever, neither in the EU nor in Germany, to reduce emissions from to, to not reduce uh, the emissions from fossil fuels or to not give it priority. Uh, quite the contrary, we have committed ourselves to become climate neutral by 2050. And this means that the fossil fuel emissions should be re reduced as far as possible. And through thus um, or by massively using renewables. This starts with the electricity generation. Of course, we know that we have to switch 
very quickly to 100% renewables. And it also applies to other areas which still need renewables. They need to be electrified, for example, transportation, in order to have um, the possibility of 100% renewables here. So this is actually the absolute priority for us at the moment. And the objective or the target that the European Union wants to set itself, and which is being discussed, and I hope that by the end of the year we will have um, determined it, um, which is 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions of the EU should be reduced uh, by 2030 below the level of 1990. So this has nothing to do with nature-based solutions. This is actually focusing on the reduction of emissions. And this is the main focus of the whole debate. In the long run, and this is uh, quite right in terms of the full carbon neutrality by 2050, it will be very difficult to they reach a 90% reduction of all emissions. Um, and then what you've just mentioned comes into play. So the possible offsetting of emissions through natural carbon sinks um, or other storages. So, But nature-based solutions, to be quite clear, is much more from our perspective than just carbon storage. Nature-based solution means that uh, the possibilities of nature are being used by protecting biodiversity and by protecting the environment itself and also by enhancing it and strengthening it and secondly the possibilities of adaptation that are available through nature-based uh, solutions um, in terms of ecosystems, for example, it should be used more strongly. For example, coastlines or tropical areas, we want to maintain mangroves and corals. Um, this is also a nature-based solution, and it uh, is better than building dams, which is um, doesn't work in the long run, and it's even uh, more affordable. And eventually, nature-based solutions also make a contribution to sustainable development for the local population. And I can once again uh, mention coral reefs and mangroves. So their protection allows the local population to maintain the local fish grounds and also their livelihoods. That much as an initial statement from my side. Oh, one thing I'd like to add, of course, I forgot one thing. Um, the maintaining or maintenance of carbon sinks or the enhancement is also very important. And of course, forests play a major role in this regard. We can mm, no longer afford a deforestation and not only in tropical areas, but also elsewhere. The forests need to be maintained and we have to re for uh, the reforestation or we have to plant trees and this is also the target or the objective of the this uh, plant tree plant challenge. Uh, this is an initiative that our ministry has uh, supported. We want to restore degraded areas, natural landscapes, and um, also through through forests, but also grasslands. So natural uh, landscapes that have a high potential for carbon storage and uh, not only carbon but at the same time they uh, improve biodiversity and protect biodiversity and they also enhance the livelihoods of local populations thank you very much thank you so much mr norris and you said uh, that uh, we're not interested in compensation or in uh, the pretext to use nature-based solutions in order to not have to reduce emissions at uh, some other place but my impression is that many companies are indeed interested uh, uh, in uh, prolonging and delaying the process just a little bit how can you guarantee that uh, the right uh, framework uh, conditions are created short term in 2030 we don't have any interest in doing so how do we guarantee it uh, with the legal framework we have the emission trade in europe that does not allow for that and the emission trade will be the central the core point uh, of uh, 
the uh, new proposal of the EU Commission in order to bring about the goal for 2030 and uh, companies won't even have the possibility to do so. Then again, uh, it is important to have uh, voluntary commitments uh, to become committed uh, for nature conservation, but this has not anything to do with legally binding uh, agreements and targets. And Ms. Kill just uh, expressed a very critical stance uh, about the RED agreement and uh, future situations. Uh, will it provide more room for RED and nature based solutions? Are you equally skeptical when it comes to the measurability? And uh, how about uh, the direction of thrust? Does this uh, deviate the interest a bit from the debate? Ms. Kill is right uh, when she says that RED has not delivered the way we expected a few years ago. Indeed, it is very difficult uh, to make a transparent carbon accounting and uh, to uh, have uh, results-based payments in the practice. And have we, we've learned a lot in the last years, and we know that it needs a lot more to conserve our forests than to have a red mechanism in place. And then I cannot agree with her when she says that uh, the discussion in the last years is only about red and carbon accounting and not about the drivers of deforestation. This is merely not right, because we are indeed discussing about the drivers of deforestation, which are, for example, uh, bad government governance systems, um, or uh, wrong implementation of the uh, local conditions. I can only refer to Brazil and the government in place uh, that is doing everything possible uh, to not implement uh, right, uh, but uh, uh, actively foster illegal measures um, they, that uh, they want to um, stop the surveillance of uh, forest uh, deforestation. This is a very clear and obvious drive of deforestation. And then we have the big international value chains. This is something that uh, we are discussing. The trade relations, of course, are contributing to the fact that deforestation can take place. And we are all conscious that our own consumption behavior uh, the meat production and soy production has uh, exacerbated the situation in Latin America and is a strong driver of deforestation. Therefore, we have quite intensive debates about this issue and about how the risk uh, of deforestation that is closely linked to, to those trade chains can be reduced and can be uh, translated in the pricing of international trade ways. And um, the companies are interested in not selling any products that have to do with the deforestation because this is very bad for their reputation. Therefore, we can really depict a financial risk for the companies. So if uh, the product uh, is labeled um, saying that the product has uh, contributed to the deforestation in the Amazon forest, then of course, uh, this product cannot be sold. And it can be a good argument to not bring those products on the market. And there is a increasing willingness and um, of the companies uh, to take this into consideration. We work closely with initiatives that are driven by the private sector that are fostering this way of thinking in no way all of the companies are interested in selling the products that are linked to this kind of image and reputation. We work closely with the forest countries in order to improve their governance systems uh, so that they can work closely together with their local authorities in order to extend their capacities to make sure that uh, local communities uh, have uh, an income, that smallholders can do their business in a way that uh, they are not driven further into the forest. And for that, of course, uh, support and 
the right funding measures are needed. And so the example that you were giving with the cooking facilities uh, was positive because this is the way we envision it, that uh, the local communities are compensated for not making use of uh, the forest. So that uh, biodiversity is conserved. And this can be done partly by um, fostering a sustainable agriculture, that the cooking facilities uh, don't need as much uh, wood uh, to be burned. But uh, in a large scale perspective, it is much more difficult um, that sense and skill is right. But uh, we are in no means interested in only implementing red mechanisms and by that uh, saving our forests. We just received feedback from the audience. You just said that you think that nature-based solutions can only um, make a bigger contribution later on, but our climate uh, targets are that far off uh, that pressure is increasing to start a lot earlier. This would be the first question. I, I would have a second one. You said that uh, the consumers are the ones who drive the demand and uh, that we are not creating these kind of problems where investments uh, of uh, companies uh, like Bonga or Unilever are made. But is this not up to the politics to make life easier for consumers and to create the right framework conditions? I'd like to take up the last question first. Of course, I cannot speak on behalf of the federal government as a whole. But uh, I would like to talk about uh, uh, a certain legislation, um, the Supply Chain Act. This is something uh, that we are really interested in, to work together with the different governments. I don't know if this uh, act is uh, to be approved in this legislature uh, in this during this mandate, but um, the responsibility is not only upon the consumers, but as well upon the companies. And on a short term, and I'm talking about the next 10 years, uh, when we talk about reducing emissions, nature-based solutions are not to compensate uh, what we can do in reducing emissions directly. So we're working on reducing fossil fuel emissions uh, going towards uh, zero this is um, this applies to transportation to um, energy efficiency in the industry in our facility management so this is our utmost priority in in the next 20 to 30 years we will reach a threshold where it will become really difficult certain processes in our petrochemical processes uh, and in public transport maybe as well in the heavy load transport uh, maybe we need something else apart from electrical solutions so this is when the time comes when we have to think about alternatives artificial fuels biomass that can be used or may it be that uh, in some fields we have to compensate by using the nature-based solutions uh, we have talked about that uh, try to burn biomass uh, and release carbon that then have to be sequestrated. Um, but uh, the supply chains uh, are very important when we take a closer look at uh, uh, biodiversity. Uh, there's nothing to say against it. Um, we have many trees that have been uh, destroyed by storms or by the bark beetle, and those have to be replaced. And I don't see anything wrong 
about that, to extend the forest uh, to um, wet the wetlands again and to create more potential. But this is not a first priority in order to reduce emissions, but it is a measure in order to conserve the biodiversity and um, the natural compensation potential that we have nowadays. Maybe just a, fo a short follow-up question with uh, the plea to really be brief on that. Uh, here we're talking about the afforestation here in Germany and uh, the uh, Ministry of Agriculture has just provided 500 million euros in order to help uh, the uh, industry. But as I can see, there's hardly any restriction on how this is done if this is, be, is to be done in the form of monocultures or if uh, biodiversity is an element to be taken into consideration. How do you assess that? Of course, uh, I'm not uh, familiar with the details of uh, the restrictions or conditions uh, for the financing, but I know that uh, public and private actors know very well that monoculture is not our future because the largest driver of uh, loss of biodiversity and the largest threat of forests is climate change. And uh, of course, uh, we have to adapt to climate change and monocultures, of course, is not the solution. Um, if, um, uh, if, now, I think the experts know that for monocultures is not the solution. Now, I would like to come to Kate Dooley. What Borson just said that we have a win-win-win situation and it seems to be the contradiction. We have the problems, we have the criticism, we have uh, maybe a bad governance or a lacking framework. Uh, of lucky framework conditions when it comes to nature-based solutions, but could we not uh, do this uh, three-tier approach to not only conserve biodiversity, but uh, to strengthen it when we store carbon and uh, to provide uh, potential for progress for communities if we do it right, if we account on a diverse uh, uh, culturization to bring more green on the earth, um, not only to store carbon, but uh, to cool down the earth and so on. So what has to happen when we have to, we would like to see a win-win situation like that. Um, yeah, uh, certainly um, we're not trying to say that restoring carbon into the earth and restoring ecosystems is inherently um, a bad thing. It's all about the um, incentives for, for doing this and the governance structures and, and how it's um, carried out at a very local level. So the first, if you want to win-win, the first um, point, just touching in on my presentation, needs to be that we're not allowing the continuation of burning fossil fuels when we restore nature. Even if we do it all right, if we burn fossil fuels, that's going to undermine ecosystems anyway. Climate change is also a big driver of biodiversity loss. Um, so once that's agreed and we're not burning more fossil fuels, then we can focus on um, ecosystem restoration in ways that are beneficial to the planet and people. And that really requires um, as much as, po well, it's something that I call um, rights-based ecosystem approaches. So I think that's the terminology we need to be looking at instead of nature-based solutions, which is very abstract is, um, uh, I mean, Shell's promoting nature-based solutions, so really it can't be a good thing for climate change. Um, but rights-based ecosystem approaches means first we need to recognize and respect rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. And community, the reason for that, if we want successful um, outcomes, is community-based approaches and community um, land governance mechanisms have been shown to be the most successful at um, not just protecting, but also restoring nature. And then um, going beyond people and just, there's been a lot of questions in the chat about um, what types of um, uh, approaches are best for climate mitigation, what types of ecosystems are best. And um, really, because the climate and biodiversity crisis are both so severe and so urgent to tackle, we really need to do think to think of this from a perspective of restoring nature and conserving biodiversity broadly. So not just focusing on carbon-rich ecosystems, but also then carbon-rich ecosystems are important, and the ones um, that are really most important to focus on there are 
what has been referred to as irrecoverable carbon. So ir irrecoverable, just saying that again, in case the translators didn't get us. So this is wahrscheinlich the, das größte Das ist wahrscheinlich das größte Problem, dass well, I think this might be the biggest problem that the climate community and the biodiversity community uh, are still uh, well living side by side without um, uh, talking to each other. But one other question to you, um, okay, Dooley, um, one question from the chat from the audience. So how early should Germany or how early should the EU reach a net zero in order to have not additional pressure on the nature-based solutions. Uh, can you name this? Can you give us a figure? Um, so the figure I would give is, is 2035, um, 2040 at the latest. And this is from some papers that have been published. Um, it's important for the EU, for people to understand that the European Union has already exceeded its carbon budget. All of the carbon budget for wealthy areas of the world they have used, they need to be going to um, zero emissions as quickly as possible, as well as supporting the transition in poorer countries. And that includes protecting and restoring nature and focusing on those carbon dense ecosystems such as peatlands, mangroves, etc. Um, so, so that, yeah, I would say much more ambitious timeline than is being discussed, but also it's really possible with the, um, with the sort of re energy revolution that we're seeing. Yeah, we sind, das ist ja bis 2050 sonst angepeilt. Well, das heißt, our target is 2050, so this would be much later. Thank you very much, Kay Dooley. And I would like to ask the same question in terms of a win-win option of the uh, um, thinking together, so to speak, uh, to Corena de la Plaza. So what needs to happen from your point of view so that these kind of solutions can make progress? Or maybe you can give us a concrete example where you would say, well, this is an example where everyone benefited, forest, um, biodiversity and the indigenous people. So could you give us an example maybe? Yeah, so I, mean, I fully agree with uh, what we Kate said that I think that a concrete example that is a win-win for everyone are ecosystem-based approaches. And again, that, that's uh, defined already, that are right-based and that are also uh, gender responsive. I think that's the key. And um, so just to be clear, because I'm also seeing some questions uh, in the chat, it's not that uh, we are against uh, planting trees, of course, if they are like native species and if these are initiatives, as I said before, that are led and governed by communities and they, you know, contribute to the ecosystem restoration, that's totally fine, of course. The problem we are seeing is that uh, mainly in some regions, that is not what it's being done under some of these initiatives, but just answer your question. So that would be ecosystem-based uh, approaches with, you know, uh, that are gender responsive and uh, rights-based. And of course, it's key that we acknowledge and protect and, you know, give the um, rights to the land for indigenous people, local communities and women, because um, of course these are gender sensitive issues too and the access on and rights over the natural resources so they can continue to uh, be the stewards and conserve biodiversity and ecosystems. Was heißt eigentlich ganz genau rechte basierte Ansatz? Does it exactly mean rights based approach? How can it look like? Frau de la Plaza, sind Sie noch da? Uh, Mr. La Plaza? Yeah, yeah, sorry, there? sorry, I thought yeah. that you were going to the to the next uh, speaker. So first of all, as uh, I just mentioned, I think it's key nee, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> governments uh, recognize and acknowledge uh, those rights. And then you do a mapping uh, with communities and about what the threats they see, external and internal, to their um, own initiatives, to their own adaptation strategies and even mitigation. So they, they map themselves what those threats are and they propose the solutions. And then you, of course, have to support those solutions to those threats from you know, a legal uh, point of view, economic, and so on. So that's how a community-led and governed initiative would uh, look like, in, in my opinion. 
Okay, vielen Dank. Dann äh, jetzt auch noch mal an Thank Jutta. you very much. Now to Jutta Kill. The following question. Mr. Gosen has uh, agreed to many of the things that you said, actually. And he said, well, um, we have to have differentiated uh, look at things. And uh, there are many um, unsolved issues. And we are not really doing any compensation or offsetting. So are you satisfied with this? Um, and what I would also like to know from you is how can you make sure that there is a win-win? Um, of course, everyone would agree that the fossils have to uh, go away first, uh, but then um, this could also be done with the funding from the companies, uh, for example. Well, <clears throat> I would like to give you the answer to the second question first. I'm convinced that win-win with nature-based solutions in the current situation of different uh, interests um, is not possible. It's simply not possible. Um, this means neglecting the key interests here. So just look at the web pages of the oil producers. Uh, Corina de Plasio mentioned at the beginning an event which took place in parallel to the climate um, summit in Madrid last year. So oil groups for nature-based solutions. Um, I mean, this tells us a lot. So take a look at the web pages of the big oil groups. So one after the other actually commits to become climate neutral, carbon neutral, uh, etc. So it's, it's crazy. Um, Italy's oil group uh, INI um, has no intention of leaving oil or gas in the ground. They are not talking about protecting the natural carbon sink. Um, this needs to go away and nature should actually um, offset this. A nature-based solution offers um, the pretext for it, because as long as there is no clear statement that nature-based solutions are um, nature-based distractions, actually, from this key question that needs to be at the core, which is the protection of natural carbon things, um, uh, it, um, I mean, all this is just announcements. Um, they lead to land grabbing and land degradation in other areas. So any would need land to the size of half of Italy in order to offset all the uh, emissions generated through the extraction of oil and gas. So there is no um, win win many people have to pay dearly for this win-win and uh, it will not people living in our countries and i think this is really risky if you support this idea i mean there will be beautiful nice small projects um, i'm sure of that um, i'm sure you can find these kind of projects however the problem lies elsewhere the problem is that this term is being picked up by those who have no interest at all in making contribution to the protection of the climate or to avoid displacement. And this is really dangerous. We've already seen it with red. No international forest instrument of the past 30 years that I've been dealing with this topic, forest protection, etc., is has been so a violent prone and conflict prone like red. And if you want to enhance the spectrum to nature-based solutions, then we will pave the way knowingly, or at least we should know it, uh, we will pave the way for land grabbing in a massive scale. And for us, for politics and civil society, it, it's, it's really devastating. We have to bear the responsibility. We have to clearly say that this is not feasible because the interests are that nature-based solution will bring along massive land grabbing. 
Well, if you don't create the right framework conditions, just a brief question from the audience, because you just said, well, there might be positive or, or important reforestation um, projects or more projects. How can we assess whether it is a project which is based on monocultures, for example, or whether it's a good project? So this is something that many people from the audience want to know. Well, it's a good project if you say, well, I'm not going to compensate. I can only, um, um, of course, support restoration of um, the environment, of ecosystems, etc. But the responsibility for the emissions remains with me. This would be honest. And this would also shift the discourse in society. So what does it mean, climate transition and then um, without exacerbating uh, the initial situation. And for the overall debate in society, it would also be good to say, well, if I have to take the plane, then I have to bear the responsibility. Of course, I can still support others, but not by just um, paying for it, by trying to offset these emissions. And this is, is what the debate should actually focus on. I think it's highly problematic to say we have to compensate or offset things. No, we would make progress if we would say, well, what cannot be avoided needs to be reduced elsewhere. This means we need an economic system that is not based on endless growth on an endless planet. And so we have to uh, compensate elsewhere or reduce elsewhere. Other everything else would be an illusion. Thank you very much. So uh, final remarks, um, and I would like to ask you to be uh, brief. And Mr. Gorison, would you um, sign up to everything that has been said right now um, by um, Ms. Kill? And um, just another remark, uh, Switzerland has just uh, come to an agreement with Peru, and this is an agreement on climate certificates given to Switzerland based on forest or wood projects in Peru. So might this also be a model for the federal government? Should we uh, follow in, in this direction? Well, I would like to start uh, with uh, replying to the example you just gave. Well, Switzerland has come to an agreement with Peru in which they want to offset emissions. And I don't know the details of the agreement. I'm not sure whether it's about a wood certificates or nature-based certificates or credits. I'm not sure, but... Um, the Paris Agreement and its Article 6 would allow for a carbon trading between different nations, but it's not yet finalized. So we expect it to be finalized at the next climate conference in Glasgow next year. Um, however, Switzerland has already committed itself to um, stick to what is being negotiated and finalized there. And a very important standard is to uh, avoid uh, double selling and also the social and environmental integrity of these kind of mechanisms is very important. So I would make another point in terms of nature-based solutions and in particular in the way that has uh, it has been discussed uh, here today as an offsetting mechanism, uh, which we have not yet reached. I mean, there are not no nature-based certificates um, around right now. So these are still theoretical debates, but of course we cannot um, say that it's never going to happen. So the important thing would be to have the right framework conditions and the right safeguards. And um, a rights-based approach has already been mentioned here. And yes, of course, the rights of the local communities, in particular the indigenous people, need to be taken into account. There is also another term for it, free prior informed consent. and. Um, in all the projects, many of them pilot projects, this is being applied. Um, despite all criticism of the nature-based solutions, I mean, if nature-based solutions will contribute to massive 
human rights abuses or a detrimental effect on the imp uh, environment. I mean, this should not happen, of course. Mm. We want to maintain the quality of life, the livelihoods of the local communities. And of course, we also want to protect the biodiversity. This needs to be the framework condition. And this is what we uh, try to achieve already. But what else do we do? We cooperate with the private sector. We uh, support uh, transparent projects. Where does deforestation take place? And by whom is it done? So there are very modern methods where you can actually uh, show which company is responsible for uh, certain deforestation. And the main driver here, of course, is um, agriculture. It's much more agriculture than, for example, the oil industry that Ms. Kill has talked about. Um, the oil industry will eventually disappear because we will phase out fossil fuels eventually. So you will no longer be able to sell any oil. So, and another aspect, which is a very important one, of course, I hear your criticism and uh, I haven't heard it for the first time and we take it seriously, but we also have to discuss alternatives. So what else can we do? Um, based on my experience with the deforestation um, issues in tropical countries, uh, is, um, or my experience is that uh, funding is needed and the funding that is being made available should be channeled in the right way and linked to what we want to preserve, uh, which is the forest. And this is actually the key philosophy of the Red Plus approach that we or the indigenous people or the small scale farmers or also state authorities protect the forest and we support them in doing so. And at the same time, we want to um, maintain the livelihood and you need a mechanism to do that. Without funding, it will not be possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Gorzen. I'm sure that we could um, continue with our discussion for a long time, but unfortunately we cannot because we ran out of time already. Um, Many things have become clear here, concerns um, about human rights violations, all wrong ecological approaches like monocultures, and that the wrong debates are being held. So I hope that you are being heard, Mr. Gorzen, that it is that the, the oil industry will disappear that quickly, um, that we'll phase out uh, fossil fuels as quickly as you uh, mentioned. I think there's a lot of political work is still needed to achieve this because um, usually we um, make the experience that things take much longer than initially uh, thought. Um, so we have to get rid of the emissions, but at the same time we have to think about um, long-term nature-based solutions or maybe also the, the uh, living or system on our planet that they no longer need to be called like that, that we um, restore ecosystems on our planet. Um, and I think what we have not yet talked about is the fact that these kind of counting systems with a view to nature, um, they, they shift uh, views um, and make it more commercial, so to speak. Um, well, Many people will still be uh, a little bit disappointed because we have to stop here, but it might be an incentive for many people to read more about these topics. I would like to cordially thank, um, first of all, the speakers who have taken the time wherever you were, be it in Australia, in Spain or in Berlin. Um, I would also like to thank the organizers who uh, intensively worked uh, for the organization of this um, uh, webinar series. I'd also like to take the technicians um, without whom it would not be possible. And I'd also like to thank you, dear listeners, dear audience, for your attention and for your interest. And at the end, I would briefly like to point out that this and other webinars can be uh, looked up at the web page of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. I hope uh, it was inspiring and interesting and I wish you a nice afternoon success and all the best. Thank you very much.
Vielen Dank. Ja, vielen Dank auch von mir. Vielen Dank Auf Wiedersehen. Mal. Wiederhören. Tschüss. Tschüss. Thanks very much for that. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks for taking your time and thanks for the interesting inputs. I think it was very interesting. Bye. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.